Picture it if you can. A world where Lisp, a language now seen as a relic of the past, is seen as the language to use in programming. Seen as the language that people will be writing everything in. No C, no Fortran. They thought Lisp was going to be it. But if you look at the landscape of today, something's wrong. This didn't actually happen. In fact, the average programmer hasn't really written any Lisp in their life. In fact, they might not even know what Lisp code looks like. So what changed? Come with me as we investigate the rise and fall of Lisp. Why the world never quite hit this reality that everyone was expecting. Now let's step back in time to 1958 when John McCarthy at MIT began developing the first iteration of Lisp. Lisp was first described by McCarthy in the paper Recursive Functions of Symbolic Expressions and Their Computation by Machine, Part 1. In the paper, McCarthy discusses recursion, symbolic expressions, and many of the other core functions and features of Lisp. Quickly after, the first implementation of this language began development. The language and implementations of it continued to develop into the 1960s. The original version of Lisp was known as Lisp 1 and developed into a, another version of Lisp known as Lisp 1.5. While many still saw that there were improvements to be made, those were considered to be something intended for the future versions of Lisp, Lisp 2. Unfortunately, the development of Lisp 2 was unsuccessful and the project was abandoned. Now, in place of a Lisp 2, the development of multiple other Lisp-like languages were implemented, the first most notable one being MacLisp. MacLisp led to a lot of the big changes in the language that you can see now today in most of the more modern Lisps. Now while MacLisp derives a lot of its ideas from Lisp 1.5, it does make some notable changes. And this is the first sign of the fragmentation that we will later see on in the future of the language. A few years later, another Lisp language known as Interlisp was developed at Bolt, Birkin, and Newman, also known as BBN Technologies, in 1968. The reason that all these different systems were being developed is because each of these different companies and organizations behind them were focused on the development of AI. Now at this point, AI was quite different from how it's seen today. Today, AI is very focused on neural networks and machine learning. However, back then, AI was considered much more broad. It still is a broad topic today, but I think a lot more people have a more narrow view. Versus back then, a lot of it was focused on this concept of logic as well as symbolic artificial intelligence. Now we're gonna go ahead and jump to the 1970s since most of the fragmentation at this point hasn't been too aggressive. However, in the 1970s is when we start seeing being something known as a Lisp machine. But before we get into that, I would like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. The best way to learn something new is often by doing. Brilliant gives you hands-on lessons in mathematics, science, and computer science. I've been using Brilliant myself to assist my learning in predicate logic with its Logic 2 course. I can wholeheartedly highly recommend it to anyone interested in the topic. That's right, Brilliant doesn't only cover simple introductory mathematics, it goes all the way up to university level mathematics covering advanced topics in calculus, group theory, and much, much more. A problem I've faced is that a lot of university courses make it kind of hard to find practical examples. Brilliant is able to solve this by giving you real world problems that you can begin to solve as you learn. To try everything Brilliant Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Gavin Freeborn. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium membership. Once again, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now the Lisp machine was basically a single user system intended for the development of Lisp programs and Lisp programming. That's right, eventually people went to the extent of making dedicated hardware just to use this programming language. Now the development of these Lisp machines caused a big divergence into the language. In fact, the language diverged into three different dialects, um, possibly more, I'm not 100% sure. There seems to be other mentions of internal dialects within these dialects, but there was basically a divergence happening with the Lisp machines, as well as other Lisps being developed around the same time, such as Scheme. This was probably the biggest issue that Lisp started to face was this sort of divergence within the language and incompatibility. By this point, pretty much no code could be shared between these different systems because a lot of them would use incompatible features between all these different languages. Now in the 1980s, there was a big demand to standardize all these different dialects and bring them all together into one single language. This language would eventually be known as Common Lisp. 
Now by the 1980s, from my research, I've noticed that there was actually a pretty steep decline in the actual Lisp usage, and I think a lot of this has to do with the ties to artificial intelligence. You see back then there was a lot of this assumption that AI was going to be able to do everything. People weren't too sure on where the limitations were, and a lot of these big AI companies and universities made these grand promises of what was possible and what it could eventually do. While prototypes were able to be developed and massive feats in programming were able to be made, the development past these simple prototypes was very slow and seemed to run into a wall very quickly. Some of these limitations were from performance and some of these were just purely due to the situation in programming. A lot of people hadn't really developed a way to get past this and a lot of this was research and so it was very easy for people to gratify and exaggerate their discoveries in their research which caused a lot of hubbub about why isn't it getting past this point why do we keep getting stuck what's wrong and since a lot of these companies don't really want to be blaming the programmers or say that their theory was flawed or anything like that a lot of this blame seemed to eventually fall towards lisp you see lisp wasn't really talked about as being this great thing in a lot of the research that was seen and a lot of the talks a lot of what was found was just explained as algorithms and lisp was just the language used for it and so when they couldn't get past those initial discoveries and they were wondering what's holding us back they eventually started to blame lisp so just to recap on where we're at right now the development of common lisp is happening as well as the slight decline in lisp due to ai kind of slowing down and eventually losing a lot of its funding this leads to something known as an ai winter which is a lot of what slowed down the progress of a lisp and general ai development as time went on a lot of people believe these ai winters to be the real reason that lisp failed which i could also understand but i'll continue on with what i believe to be when it started to actually uh, fail and lose its adoption now for the standardization of common lisp the members of the development were collected by different universities and different companies focused on the development of Lisp, so a lot of those companies that developed those Lisp machines were also involved in the development of the standardization of Common Lisp. Common Lisp was finally defined in 1984, so only four years after the committee being joined together, so relatively quickly there was a basis for the language described in the book Common Lisp the Language. Now this gave us a lot of room for the beginning development of the language, but there was some ambiguity in the definition since this was mostly meant as a description of the language and less so a proper standard and for this reason there was a desire to make a ANSI standard common lisp in 1986 so only two years later now the standardization of common lisp is a pretty long one and what I believe to be a major factor in why it actually didn't continue to gain adoption because from 1986, there was always this thought that like, oh, there's going to eventually be this standard. And I think this kind of slowed things down as well as the general compiler development was not very quick. The language was fairly large and there wasn't really a good way to share libraries or information because a lot of the libraries wouldn't be compatible just due to this ambiguities. Now, by the time Common Lisp was standardized in 1994, the standardization was quite heavy and they put a lot of effort into making it compatible with both the existing version of common lisp as well as being able to adapt and be optimized in the future there's a lot of undefined behavior described in it which is intentionally left there to avoid killing the language in the future because the ANSI standard was not really written with this idea that it will be updated every few years it was written with the idea that it may never be written again so what did we get out of it well we got ANSI Common Lisp, which is very descriptive, it's very clear in what it can and can't do, um, and in theory it should be able to do basically anything. It was made to be very general purpose. The performance was surprisingly fast. If you, I'll leave a link down below to a little paper that mentions the performance that they were able to get, um, just based off of where Common Lisp was at at the time. Um, but the performance and all these different things didn't quite lead to the adoption that you would hope for. You see, while the theoretical performance was quite high and the compilation was quite good and there were these new developments being made in the environment, there were some pretty big issues. The big one being performance, uh, because while it could perform well if you wrote very similar code, you would run into issues with things like writing fast code in common Lisp isn't always easy. 
for new programmers, they kind of have to really consider the performance implications versus C, which was obviously very popular at the time for most systems development. Since C was able to get great performance out of the box and they didn't have to think about it too much, it was a lot harder to gain this wider adoption, especially in applications. Now, Common Lisp did still fulfill a small niche in the prototyping phase due to being able to write up code a lot faster than something like C. You run into the issue once again with the performance long term. Since the go to data structure in Common Lisp and pretty much all Lisps is a singly linked list, a con cell, if you will, you run into a lot of performance issues when you use that for anything that an array would be better at. Lookups are always going to be worst case O of n versus with an array, it's always going to be O1, as long as you know the index at least, it's straightforward. This is kind of a major performance issue, especially the farther back you go in time. Now, there are multiple other things we could bring up on the side of performance, but that's basically the big reason why it had trouble gaining the application usage. Okay, well, what about its future as a prototyping environment? This seemed to have a lot of potential and is a lot of where its original foundations are, like I talked about before. It was able to produce prototypes very well and consistently when people were using it way back in the day in the 1980s. So what's slowing it down now? Now, I think there's a lot of different ways you could interpret this, but this is how I kind of see it. Eventually, there hit a certain point where Lisp programmers just like to write Lisp, which means that a lot of what they wrote were not applications, they were tools. And so because of this, applications written in Lisp and the maintenance and development of them was not quite as popular as just developing libraries and tooling for writing Lisp, especially since Lisp at this point is more of an environment than an actual just straight up language it really became more popular for people to develop stuff for that environment rather than to develop stuff for the outside world. Okay, well, maybe it wasn't the perfect fit for a prototyping language, but what about the wider adoption? Why did that not happen? Well, by the time that the average person was even able to run Lisp, because Lisp was not a lightweight language, it required quite a lot to run. Common Lisp was a large standard. It took a while to get it on different systems and get a proper compiler going. Computers were still expensive at this point. There's a lot of different things. And so by the time that people were even able to program, they often weren't given the option to even use Lisp, even if they were curious about it. Lisp was very much relegated for quite a long time to the academic and more industrial side of the world. There wasn't so much the normal hacker in their basement developing uh, Lisp programs or anything like that. So the user base was quite small. It was very, very relegated to a small niche by this point. Most of these people that were even getting a chance to program in their free time were not going to be able to access it. They were using something like Basic, maybe Fortran, maybe C, but just Lisp wasn't very available. Okay, so maybe a little later, did those sort of people start developing prototypes in Lisp? Well, no. By this point, since we're in the 90s, this is when we start to see the emergence of Perl, PHP, a lot of these other scripting languages that are very much geared towards things like the internet and making quick little one-liners, which Lisp wasn't very great at. The one-liners were good in its environment, but you weren't really throwing them at the command line or making a little one-liner application. That wasn't quite as common. Now, at this point, it was too little too late. Common Lisp came pretty late, the internet was already becoming a thing and booming, and this is kind of what led languages like Perl to become what people called like the glue of the internet, um, and PHP to become popular, and that's not even mentioning the behemoth that became Java. And so this kind of took over that sort of um, headspace that I was talking about before. Back in the 1980s, people thought that Lisp was going to be it, everyone was going to be writing code in Lisp. But then by the time that we hit the late to mid 90s, uh, when Java is getting advertised, people started saying this about Java, people started thinking Java was the future. And this is kind of what took over a lot of this uh, available space. There's actually some really interesting talks of companies that used Lisp and then moved to Java because some CEO heard about it and heard it was going to be the hot new thing. So they had to implement it into their project and the Lisp portion was dropped in favor of Java even when it was still so new that there wasn't really anything to back that other than a company's name behind it. And unfortunately, while there was all this happening, Lisp was way behind. The situation for libraries was hardly even a thing. Perl already had a fairly functional package manager. Was it perfect? No, but most prototypes don't need to be perfect. And that's kind of the situation we were in. Lisp support for sharing libraries was way, way behind. Uh, quick Lisp was what like 
far, far down into the future um, to the point that by the time Quick Lisp was popular and available and existed, it was too little too late. And even in academia, unfortunately, Lisp started to lose its footing. Specifically for teaching, it became a lot less popular for introductory languages. Um, for example, Scheme was for a while very popular, but eventually Python at a lot of universities became its replacement. And this is kind of its last little ground and its footing, and it started to really lose its opportunity at getting new people introduced to it. And at this point, it started becoming more and more niche, only to those covering the occasional AI class that actually talked about using Common Lisp or Scheme. And this brings us to today. The current state of Lisp is unfortunately not super promising. I think there is a pretty big boom with things like Clojure becoming popular. Racket gained a lot of adoption and is also very large in academia, mostly just due to programming theory being a very big prominent part of Lisp, which I didn't get to talk about too much in this video. Um, and Common Lisp is still like gaining adoption and gaining functionality, but at this point it is uh, really missed its chance at becoming something equivalent to Python or Java when it comes to being like the language that everyone's using. So why did Lisp fail? Well, it didn't really fail. It just unfortunately had really bad timing. The adoption just wasn't there early on, and it really just missed its chance at becoming this behemoth that it should have been. It's tragic, but I think it really shows a lot about the adoption of languages and how this sort of thing works. It isn't just oh, this language is great, so everyone will use it. That's not usually how it works. There's a lot of different parts and components to things. Something like C will probably always be used because so much C is compatible. There isn't really any, no code from old C is being thrown away. While common Lisp is fairly compatible with really old code, it's not very easy to use that code considering that a lot of that code is meant for these Lisp machines that have special instructions. Um, and there's a lot of incompatibility, unfortunately and a lot of fragmentation that happened over the years. I didn't even talk about Scheme in this video, mostly because that's a whole other uh, explanation that I'd probably have to get into. But Scheme as well is a language in itself that is extremely divergent and fragmented. And yeah, that's it for today's video. I hope this helped you guys get a better understanding of the history of Lisp, as well as the history of its adoption and kind of why it isn't as widely used today as you would expect, considering how much people adore it and talk about it all the time, especially myself. Now, before we end off this video, I just wanted to give one last thank you to Brilliant, as well as a thank you to my supporters on Patreon and my supporters on GitHub sponsors. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.